So my name is Ido, um, and me and Andre, which is sitting right here, uh, we both worked on a project uh, in the company Funbox. Uh, the title of the project is Onboarding User Segmentation, and I'll try to tell you about a bit about the project and the process that we went through in this impossible time slot of 15 minutes. So uh, before everything and the project itself, Funbox, the company, they're a Tel Aviv-based fintech company which provides credit to small businesses in the United States. Uh, they already deployed more than $1 billion um, since 2013, so that's huge. Um, and the reason they're interesting to us and everyone sitting here in this room is because their entire process of deciding on who gets credit and who doesn't is automatic. It's machine learning and data science driven. Um, in Funbox, Jonathan Yari sitting over there uh, was the team leader and Segev uh, here was the mentor uh, from YData. You're both great guys. We appreciate your help along the way a lot. Um, so, what is onboarding funnel? What does it even mean? It's the process where a client registers and actually becomes a client for the company. So it all starts on the landing page of funbox.com. Um, the user registers with an email and phone number, basic details, connects his bank account and accounting software, whatever they have. Um, the Funbox, go and grab all the data that they have from that specific user, run a model, that's the decision stage, and in the end, the user gets a dashboard that looks like this, it's probably difficult to see, where he sees, first of all, if he's accepted for credit or not, and the amount that he can take. So the data we were provided from Funbox was tabular. We had over two million rows of events that are created during this process of the onboarding. Um, there were 458 different event types and more than 51,000 users. That sounds like a lot, right? Well, the data itself looked like this. There's not a lot here. Basically, what we have is event names, time that they were created, and, of course, the user ID and a label if the user finished or didn't finish the onboarding funnel and got to the dashboard in the end. One signifies that the user saw that dashboard and zero means he got stuck somewhere along the way and didn't finish the process. <clears throat> so our main goal in the end was to predict on users which of those users will complete the funnel which, uh, and which won't. And of course, to do that, we need to go over a, an entire process of uh, exploring the data, figuring out what we even have, cleaning the data, analyzing it, modeling, and of course improving over and over again. This is something probably most of you uh, know in depth. So we'll start by exploration. We had 458 different event types. Um, Andre and I, neither of us come from a financial background. We don't work at Funbox. We don't necessarily know what these events mean. Uh, and also, many of the event types have all kinds of acronyms and domain-specific and product-specific uh, terminology that we didn't know. So, of course, we had to sit down with the people at Funbox and figure out what all those things mean. But that still wasn't enough. To better understand the, the events, uh, we went to the uh, website, started onboarding, and sniffed the events ourselves and we could definitely see those events being fired from the browser as we were doing that process. So that helped us figure out what the events actually mean at some point. Later on, when we went to actually do some real work, we needed to clean the data. So uh, events, we had some assumptions regarding the data before we started. So we thought the events are ordered by some way, either by event ID or by time, uh, and we assumed that a user, a specific user, all of his events have the same label. Unfortunately, both of these things were uh, shown to be wrong. The events were in order, that's not a big issue. We all know how to do that. Um, but we did have an issue that users, specific users had multiple events. So users finished and didn't finish the funnel at the same time, so that was something that we needed to solve. Uh, and we found out that we have an additional layer of challenge, which is lots of garbage events. 
So 458 event types, some of them don't actually have any information. Um, and we did more things, and I'll go over in depth just on one thing for lack of time, which is the multiple labels for each user issue. Um, so as I stated, there's that problem or challenge or however you want to call it, uh, where users have multiple labels. Now, we, we did all kinds of fancy maneuvers and took care of all kinds of fancy use cases, uh, which we thought would probably happen, like a user finishes the, the, fu the funnel um, and then comes back and doesn't finish and then goes back and does finish and all kinds of different crazy cases. In the end, we actually looked at the data, I don't know, stupid, uh, and we saw that users always, that users that have multiple labels always start in zero and end up in one. So our solution to that simple problem was to just map them all as one in the end, even though we took care of lots of fancy cases. And if we're already dealing on the subject of labels, um, it's probably a good question to, to ask, uh, should we actually model users or sessions? Well, first of all, the, the quick cut answer to this question is that the business problem required uh, predicting on users. So initially that's, that's the solution to that problem, uh, but also we noticed when we were playing around with onboarding that if we stop in the middle of the process, when we come back, we resume the process from where we stopped. So that also gave us confidence to continue uh, modeling on users and not on sessions. But it, did, uh, it was a subject of a lot of discussion. Uh, so now, after we explored our data and we cleaned it a bit, we can start with the actual analysis. So this was the graph that I showed you earlier. Uh, this was the funnel, sorry. So we, went to, we wanted to create a graph of the users and the events that they took. And we assumed we'll probably get something that looks like this, you know, some kind of orderly process that starts with registration and ends in the dashboard. The graph looked like this. It was a huge mess. At first, we didn't know exactly what to make of this. But after playing around with some different layouts, it turned out it, this wasn't completely useless. So uh, this is a, the same data in a different layout. And we can see two different, uh, significant, two distinct cl clusters here. On your right side, we can see there's a bunch of events which uh, are administrative things like sending emails, contact us clicked, and all kinds of stuff like that. And on your left, you can see events that are related to financial integration, connecting to a bank, downloading the data, and so on. So that was useful for us to figure out the different types of events, the families of events that we have here in our data. Uh, and we continued our analysis with clustering. We tried to use um, completely unsupervised k-means with two k equals two. Um, but before we did that, we need to turn our events table into a users table. And we just use a very simple representation of users by just counting the different events of each type for each user. So essentially, instead of a bunch of different events, each user had a single vector. Its length was the number of different event types we had. Uh, and each cell, there was a count for each event type, how many times that event occurred for that user. Um, and just by taking that data and running it through k-means, we can see that there is some kind of differenti differentiation here between the two groups. Um, if you've been paying attention, earlier I said 470-something event types. And here on the, on the slides, we have 274D. Uh, meaning dimensions. So uh, that's part of the garbage cleaning that we did. We reduced the number of event types with meaning to 274, and we used principal component analysis to project it down to two dimensions so we can visualize it. And this visualization with k-means, it might not mean anything by itself, but actually we, we took this, um, these two groups from k-means and we checked how, how do they match to the true labels. And we saw that they match to 66.7 of the true labels. If this was 50%, it would mean it's completely random. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, but actually, because it was 66.7, it gave us some hope that the data, even though it's, it doesn't have a lot, 
it still has some signal and something that we can work with to model it further. So this was a very hopeful moment for us. Um, and then we went on to create a baseline model. We just used re uh, logistic regression with the event count vector that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, we used the 20% test set, and here you can see the results. We had 99.7 and 99.5 uh, accuracy on the two labels. Job done, we can go home, right? Not really. This is way too good. Um, and we immediately thought that we have some kind of target leakage. So some event that represents directly the label and the end. Um, and that indeed was the case. We went on to do univariate analysis on each of our features to find the target leak. And obviously, in the end, we found four features that are actually client approved for credit or client rejected for credit. It's uh, just pure target leakage. And um, uh, after this, we just removed them uh, and ran further models. Now, we created a bunch of different features. I won't go into the details of exactly what we, which features we created. Uh, and we used them to, and ran more models, logistic regression, SVM, random forest. Uh, and in the end, all their, um, all their performance was pretty much comparable, it was pretty much the same, and we ended up choosing the most basic of those, that bunch, uh, which was, again, logistic regression. Uh, you can see the performance here. Uh, I think this is not the issue that is, is important to, to go into depth, and uh, we'll see in a minute why. Uh, so we have 81%, 81.4% on the zero label, and 88.9% accuracy on the one label, and we'll go over why this is less than the main important part here in a sec. So a bit of uh, possible next steps. We did engineer a lot of features, but there's still a lot more ideas that we had during the brainstorming sessions here of features that we would have liked to have and we just didn't get to. Uh, of course, there's also the option of using recurrent neural networks, which is kind of expected in a problem such as this. Um, and the third part, which may be the most important, that if ever the people at Funbox want to make this an actual product and actually use it in a real world, we need to decide at which point of time uh, we want to run the prediction and cut the, tr the user trips, per se, uh, uh, at that point and model on those partial trips. Uh, and then if that user, let's say after two minutes in the process, we figure out that the user has zero chance of finishing the funnel, we can just give him a call and just uh, help him move along the lines and get to that dashboard, which uh, is good for Funbox, because it's just more money. Um, some insights on what Andre and I learned from this project uh, and we can take from here to every data science project that we have. So first of all, low signal data is surprising. Uh, sometimes it's, we're, we were very pessimistic that we can actually do anything with the data here, but in the end, I think even Andre, which was the most pessimistic, uh, was, uh, was fine with the performance that we got in the end. So low signal data is, is surprising. Don't be too pessimistic in your projects. Um, the second thing is probably obvious to everyone sitting here, is don't solve fancy use cases until you look at the data and see that you actually have them, which was a big thing for us. Uh, and the third one is that basic models, uh, meaning not neural nets or anything sophisticated, it may do the job just fine, and don't, uh, don't forget to use those things in each project that you do. Um, thank you very much for the time and attention uh, and staying awake. Um, Andre is here, you can see his photo if you don't recognize him. I'd like to just take the, the second that I have left to thank again Segev and the people at Funbox. It was a real pleasure working with you guys. Thanks a lot.